In 1960, future Nobel Prize winner Ronald Coase wrote The Problem of Social Cost. Now, as law review articles go, this is a famous one. It introduced the Coase theorem to the legal lexicon, and it's notable for the non-intuitive argument that sometimes having clear property rights might matter more than who gets to control certain property interests. The article concerns the problem of externalities, which are costs or benefits of an action that are borne by someone other than the actor. When a factory emits smoke, for example, the smoke causes harm that the factory owner does not experience and therefore does not take into account in deciding whether to operate or not. Because the consequences are external to the decision to operate, we might therefore get more smoke than we want. Now, it's important to remember that externalities are not always negative. For example, our hypothetical factory pays wages to workers. They, in turn, spend money at stores, restaurants, and so forth. That stimulates economic development. But these happy spillovers are also external to the decision to operate or not on the part of the factory owner. So how do we address negative externalities like, say, factory smoke? Regulation is a traditional answer. Regulation may limit or stop the harmful activity, so maybe the factory owner is allowed to emit a certain amount of smoke, or maybe they're told to stop altogether. Alternatively, we might charge a fee to the factory owner that reflects an estimate of the harm that is caused by the smoke. This is sometimes called Pigouvian taxation. Now, enter Coase. He argued that these approaches are question-begging in light of the problem of reciprocity of harms, which is something we discussed in an earlier video. So if neighbor A wants to build a coffee shop that will annoy neighbor B, it's wrong to see A as the one who is inflicting harm because, in Coase's words, we are dealing with a problem of a reciprocal nature. To avoid the harm to B would inflict harm on A. The real question that has to be decided is, should A be allowed to harm B, or should B be allowed to harm A? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. So in the coffee shop hypothetical, somebody loses. Either the coffee shop annoys the neighbor because it's allowed to operate, or the neighbor gets to stop it, causing harm to the entrepreneur. For Coase, therefore, the issue is not stopping harm. There's going to be harm, but rather ascertaining whether the complaint of act does more harm than good. Are we better off with the coffee shop or without it? Coase's insight is that the market may be able to help here, so long as property rights are clear and there are no transaction costs. It is always possible to modify by transactions on the market the initial legal delimination of rights. And of course, if such market transactions are costless, such a rearrangement of rights will always take place if it would lead to an increase in the value of production. So to illustrate that, imagine a world in which there is only a smoke-producing factory and its owner, and a house and its owner who has sued the factory for causing a nuisance. So I guess they're both appealing to some kind of law-giving supercomputer. Once our robot judge decides the nuisance suit, we will have clarity on the property rights of the parties. Either the homeowner's property right includes the right to stop the factory, or the factory owner's property rights include the right to emit smoke, even if the homeowner objects. So let's say the homeowner wins and may now stop the factory owner, gets a right to an injunction. In a world without transaction costs, what happens next? Well, to know that, we need to know more about what the parties want. Yes, the homeowner wants the smoke to stop. But how badly? And how much does the factory owner value operation? So let's attach some numbers to this. Let's suppose, hypothetically, that the homeowner values life without smoke at $50, and the factory owner values operating at $100. Given that, what happens next? We would expect the factory owner to pay the homeowner to release the injunction and allow operation because the factory owner values operation more than the homeowner values life without smoke. So even though the homeowner wins the lawsuit, the smoke is still going to flow once the factory owner pays the homeowner off. Now, what if our robot judge reached a different result? What if the smoke was not a nuisance? Well, then there's no deal to be had. The factory owner's property rights include the right to operate and emit smoke. 
and the factory owner values that right more than the homeowner values smoke-free living. So again, the smoke still flows. So one interesting consequence of our hypothetical scenario is that the initial allocation of property rights does not matter with regards to whether the factory operates. Absent transaction costs, factory operations continue no matter which owner wins the right to harm the other. Now this works in reverse. Let's reverse the values. Suppose the homeowner values life without smoke at $100 and the factory owner values operating at $50. Now the factory will shut down regardless of who wins the nuisance suit. If the homeowner wins, it's not worth it to the factory owner to pay the homeowner off. If the factory owner wins, the homeowner will pay some amount over $50 to get the factory to shut down. Now this insight is referred to as the Coase Theorem. The theorem has a variety of expressions, but basically it's the idea that absent transaction costs, parties will bargain to efficient outcomes concerning externalities regardless of the initial allocation of property rights. One implication for nuisance law is the suggestion that if transaction costs are low, it might matter more that property rights be clear than that they be properly assigned in the first instance. Now, some caveats. Although Coase's insight is a powerful one, we should note at least four reasons to be cautious in drawing normative lessons from Coase. Before starting, however, it's important to note that these caveats are not critiques of Coase's article. They are rather reactions to a potential simplistic rendition of the Coase theorem, which Coase did not make, that we should simply let the market resolve all resource allocation questions. First, as Coase himself emphasized, transaction costs are always present in the real world, and they're often quite high. So it may very well matter in practice who gets the property right initially. So if a factory is emitting smoke that falls on a neighborhood rather than a single homeowner, bargaining costs may be really large. The neighbors will face the difficulty of coordination and the attendant problems of free riders and holdouts in coming up with a negotiating position with the factory owner. Moreover, the health consequences of the smoke may be unknown. Indeed, there's a cost to learning exactly how much the neighborhood should value freedom from smoke beyond the day-to-day -day annoyance of it. Because of transaction costs, legal allocations do matter in practice. Coase therefore spent much of his article calling for more nuanced thinking about how we address harms in society, keeping in mind their reciprocal quality. As he wrote, in devising and choosing between social arrangements, we should have regard for the total effect. This total effect includes efficiency concerns, but we can also take into account non-economic matters. This leads to a second caveat to drawing simple conclusions from the Coase theorem. Even if property right allocations matter less than we think with respect to the production of externalities, they remain really important from the perspective of distributive justice. When a judge decides whether A must pay B or vice versa, one becomes wealthier at the expense of the other. The Coase theorem tells us nothing about who should get this windfall. Of course, worrying about distributional concerns raises questions about what is the basis for preferring to reward a right to one party or the other, but that's a separate question. Wealth also matters to how the winners and losers experience a court's judgment. Money has a diminishing marginal utility. Someone with only $1,000 in total wealth is going to value an additional $1,000 a heck of a lot more than would a millionaire. Third, unequal wealth distributions mean that many hypothesized transactions are hard to imagine in practice. What does it mean for a person with a net financial worth of $10,000 to value their respiratory health at $100,000? Could such a person effectively bargain over the right of someone else to pollute the air that they breathe? Fourth, the proposition that initial allocations do not matter has been empirically challenged. People may value what they possess more than what they don't. I may, for example, be willing to pay $50 to shut a local factory down. But if my starting point is one in which the factory is not yet operating, and I have a veto over the operation, I might demand more than $50 to release that veto. My value may be something like $100.
This endowment effect may mean that initial allocations may therefore actually matter in practice. All that said, Kosa's article reminds us that there's a value to clarity in property rights and the possibility that market mechanisms may sometimes, sometimes, by no means always, sometimes be preferable to judicial allocations, that people can reach agreeable outcomes without judicial interventions. The Coase theorem is therefore an idea that is worth understanding as part of any lawyer's conceptual toolkit, even if it doesn't change your mind about any particular legal question. Thanks for watching.